Okay, thank you all for staying through. Um, I'm Harvey Goldsmith. Um, I'm a promoter, producer, manager. Uh, I've lived through this whole business for a hell of a long time. And I'm going to talk um, quite a lot about how I started, because a lot of people have been asking me all the way through Medem and other places that I go to. And um, I'm going to talk about my whole life, which basically is all about luck and timing. So uh, just to give you an idea of, for people that are starting up, kind of how it works, which is the way to do it. So I'm going to bash on through and then happy to stop for questions. Uh, if I'm in the middle of it and you have a question to ask, stick your hand up and uh, I'd like to get you involved as much as possible in what we're doing. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, I found the best way to learn how to win is by experience and learning from my mistakes. As we all know, luck and timing are major contributors uh, to anyone's success. I started my life off at university studying pharmacy. My timing was arriving late for a lecture and being nominated to become the student rep for the pharmacy department. And my luck was attending my first student union meeting and sticking my hand up when I explained that I wasn't happy with the social life at the university. And the president of the union gave me my first chance by asking me what I'd like to do about it. I suggested we should open a club for students, which he duly responded, OK, pharmacy, get on with it. This single action changed the course of my life and, of course, my career, because at that time, I liked listening to music, but that was as far as I knew anything about it. So this was my first shot. I opened Club 66 in January 1966, and it became an instant success. The reason why it was successful, because I took the student common room, transformed it into a nightclub, adapted the available lighting, I put in candles and nuts and crisps on the table and sawdust on the floor. It created an atmosphere that worked. And of course today I'm sure that health and safety will have something to, about, to say about the candles, but at that time, I didn't know at the time. But subsequently I realised that I then had an innate talent for finding the right acts. And in fact, booking the acts was the easy part. From the club, I became RAG chairman and then social secretary of the university. I started booking acts for Club 66, such as Fleetwood Mac, The Move, The Action, The Moody Blues, Manfred Mann, and the Spencer Davies group um, that had Stevie Winwood playing in it. My first big show was a RAG ball where I booked John Lee Hooker with the John Mayles Blues Brand. I'd seen the guitarist in the band, a young Eric Clapton, and I decided to feature him on my advertising. Uh, John Mayer wasn't best pleased, but I thought, you know, this kid's gonna really break. And um, so I put John Lee Hooker, John Mayer's blues band, featuring Eric Clapton. I think it's the first time anybody had ever heard of him. By the end of my time at university, I was on the finance committee, I had an office, and I was booking shows for 12 colleges and universities along the south coast. My second bit of luck and timing came out of the fact that I wanted to stand for president of the union, but my professor refused to endorse my candidacy. As a SOP, he sent me to America on an exchange course in 1967, which I left after two months. And then I took a Greyhound bus trip across America, $99 for 99 days unlimited travel. I probably saw more of America then than I've ever seen since. I arrived in San Francisco where, where the bus was crossing uh, Golden Gate Bridge and I saw a, t a concert taking place in the park below. After dumping my travel bag at the Y, I went down to the park wormed my way backstage where I befriended a band called the Grateful Dead and that was my introduction to American music. 
Whilst in San Francisco, I saw the whole Haight-Ashbury scene. I became fascinated by the brilliant artwork on the posters advertising shows, not knowing who the acts were. But particularly those of Bill Graham's Fillmore venues and Chet Helms Avalon Ballroom. Today, these are serious art collector's pieces where original posters sell for fifty to $100,000 minimum. I met them both. I did a deal with them to represent and sell their posters in the UK. Not a clue what to do or where, but I just thought these are must-haves. And what was fascinating was that the artwork, the marketing, which is why I wanted to study pharmacy in the first place, not to be a pill pusher, but actually to learn about how cosmetics and perfumery were marketing. And suddenly I realized that concerts could be marketed as well. I returned to England in September 67 after seeing an ad in the Evening Standard, became a partner in a poster company called Big O Posters located in Kensington Market, one of the two hubs of the new youth cultural scene. Big O was funding Oz Magazine and selling International Times, the two key underground papers. I thought I'd moved away from music into a life of marketing and sales, but when Oz got busted and International Times ran out of cash, I was asked to put on two fundraising concerts. I ended up working on the 14-hour Technicolor Dream at Alexandra Palace uh, with Yoko Ono and the Pink Floyd. I then put on Christmas and Christmas on Earth at Olympia with Jimi Hendrix and the Animals. So I really had got myself into the whole marketing scene. These were the first two big commercial events, albeit fundraisers, that again changed my life. The mid to eight, the late 60s period was without doubt the most creative musical period of our time. In addition to the Rolling Stones, the Beatles and the Who, bands like the Pink Floyd, Mark Bolan, Elton John, David Bowie and the beginnings of Genesis, Led Zeppelin, Cream, all came out of that era. Clearly, marketing posters were not to be and I was quickly drawn back into the world of music. As I had no real knowledge of the music business, I thought I'd better learn a bit more about it. My brother-in-law happened to be Manfred Mann's lawyer he was huge in the 60s with hit after hit in the charts. And I went to work for his manager, an Australian TV producer and manager. My only job that I've ever had lasted 10 months. During that time, I learned about the business firsthand. We had a jingles company which produced, for example, the Drink a Pint of Milk a Day campaign. So I got to learn about real marketing we managed Manfred Mann and we formed the New Seekers and I was put in charge of, marketing man of managing Manfred and his band. One well, very late night at a club called The Speakeasy, Manfred asked me to book his next tour, of which I had absolutely zero knowledge. He called me very early the next day and laid out the city he wanted to play. I quickly had to figure out what to do, but realised all the information was out there all one had to do was make calls with extreme confidence to various promoters in the UK and I learned that if you ask the right questions and listen very carefully to the answers other people would tell you everything you need to know. One promoter led to another and eventually I crafted a tour of the UK to Manfred's satisfaction. So now I've booked my first tour at the age of 22. My boss was rarely in London as he was the producer of a highly successful TV show in Australia called Hey Hey It's Saturday. On one of his few visits he sat with me and he explained that something called video was about to become very popular. He said he wanted to film as many artists as possible in ready for this new format. I didn't know what he was talking about. The first artist was Tony Bennett. He gave me a brief, brief in production, left to get on a plane back to Australia, and suddenly I'm a film producer. I was only £25 a week, paying my own expenses, which I was very pissed off about. After six months, I asked for a rise. He offered me a share of the business sometime in the future, but was not very forthcoming in delivering. 
I was filming my sixth artist, Herman's Hermits in Manchester, when I finally decided I that he had to deliver. So I called him in Sydney and demanded my pay rise. He faffed around, put me in promised land. I came so agitated that I plucked up courage, threw in the town, caught the milk train back to London, fuming, and never went to back went back to work for anybody again, ever. This turned out to be my lucky break. I called a friend that was studying at the College of Technology at the same time as me. He was learning about computers, which were about the size of this room, and he was frustrated as I was. So we decided to go into business together. Michael, my friend, had a flat in Primrose Hill, just in the north of London, and we set up an office in his kitchen. We had 50 quid each left over from our grant. Michael was a true hippie, but it was an enigma because he was the chairman of Hampstead Young Conservatives and he had a little bit of sway with the local council. Through his role, he lobbied, he lobbied Camden Council that although they had entertainment um, section and were producing an arts festival, there was nothing for young people in contemporary music. Much to our surprise, the council gave us the roundhouse and said we could present concerts there. My 10 months in management was put to good use and we began to promote shows every Sunday night with artists like Rory Gallagher, Family, The Move, Moody Blues, Earth, Wind of Fire. And at that time, the roundhouse had what we call plastic walls. Although the capacity was set at uh, 1,500 standing, some nights we'd pack in over 3,000. We'd put the venue on the map and started to make a name for ourselves. However, this was really the beginning. Somehow we managed to persuade the council to let us have Parliament Hill Fields, which is the back of, um, uh, in, in Hampstead, these is beautiful fields, to present three outdoor concerts. We had a budget of £250 and used half of it in marketing and blagged the stage and the sound of the lights for the rest. We fly posted and we use leaflets. Artists love the idea and we managed, sorry, we managed to pay, persuade the big acts of the day to play, including Fleetwood Mac, who performed at the only ever midnight show that's ever taken place in London in the park. 75,000 people showed up, including Mick Jagger, for some reason, could not get backstage. However, the local residents went mad, and unfortunately, those were the only ever concerts to be held in Parliament Hill, and the government went so crazy, they actually passed the Night Assemblies Bill, which, that was the end of midnight concerts. <laughs> The result of this, however, was the entertainment officer for the GLC, which was the overarching body for London, who attended one of the concerts, called us to say that he had under his jurisdiction the Crystal Palace Bowl, and would we be interested in putting some pop concerts there? Popular concerts, he called them. This stroke of luck started me on the next phase of my working life. The bowl was part of Crystal Palace Park Complex and was beautiful and had a capacity of 15,000. It had a conical stage and a lake in front of the stage because when it was built for the Crystal Palace exhibition, um, there wasn't any electricity and so the, the, the cone-shaped stage was a sounding board and the lake in front was a reflector. So if you were sitting in the park, the sound would come out of the cone like a seashell hit the lake and bounce upwards and it worked the audience viewed the uh, viewed the, the stage around the lake and it was fantastic Michael and I realized that if we were to make this work we needed funding and after an extended round of talking to banks who literally threw us out we decided to feed uh, to seek funding within the business we managed to put together a fantastic bill of performers for our first show, the Pink Floyd, the Faces, and an American band called Mountain. We knew that tickets would sell, but we wanted the comfort of backing to ensure financially that the event would work. We struck a deal with a famous tour promoting company called John and Tony Smith Presents. They would back us and take 50% of the profits. As it turned out, 
all they ever put up was £100 for the entertainment licence and the show sold out virtually instantly. The first of 13 Crystal Palace garden parties was born in July 1969 and the events became legendary. In 1972, John Smith, father of Tony, came to us at, to see us and then we merged all of our efforts. John wanted a step back from touring and wanted his son Tony to have partners to grow the business. They were already touring the Rolling Stones, the Who, Mark Bolan, Acker Built, the Dubliners, etc. And we were promoting at the Roundhouse and had Sunday nights at Hemel Hempstead Pavilion, a venue that, strangely enough, helped launch the careers of Elton John, David Bowie, The Pretty Things, Mott the Hoople and The Kinks. We pulled our resources and founded John Smith Entertainment. So suddenly, I was promoting nationwide tours. The company lasted until the end of 1975, when Tony Smith announced that he was leaving to manage Genesis, a band that the company had been nurturing. So we decided to split up the company. Tony took Genesis, T Michael took a band called Family that we were managing, John took a chain of clubs that he owned, and in January 1976, I started my own company. Harvey Goldsmith Entertainment was born with all of the promoting assets. I was lucky because that month I was promoting an amazing band called Lynn and Skinnerd, and then I got a phone call from the Stones, and they said they want to play something in London, where do we play? And we ended up playing Six Nights at Earl's Court, which is a massive 17,000 seat venue the following June. So off I was. So luck and timing once more raised their head and I embarked on a new career. On my own promoting company, promoting concerts all over the world, which I've carried on to this day. 1985 turned out to be a magic year. I was managing Roger Waters of the Pink Floyd, who'd left the band, and was about to take George Michael and Wham on the first ever visit of a pop band to China, when a chap called Bob Geldof started to harass me. I'd previously promoted the Boomtown Rats. I hated the punk era with an absolute passion, with the exception of actually three bands, The Jam, The Clash, and the Boomtown Rats, so we knew each other. We all knew about starvation issues in Ethiopia and Sudan, and Bob and Midge Yor created the Band Aid record. Bob wanted to do more after visiting the famine ravished countries, and called to say he wanted me to present a massive fundraising concert at Wembley Stadium. I told him I couldn't think about it until I'd returned from China via the USA launching Roger Waters' solo career. And sure enough, the morning after I arrived home, Bob was waiting outside my office and convinced me to put on Live Aid. This was ten and a half weeks before the event. I already had Bruce Springsteen playing three nights at Wembley Stadium the week after. Nevertheless, I too was concerned about the issue. All the news of the day was about food mountains in the EC, but every night on the six o'clock news, we saw those horrific pictures of starvation in Africa. It was crazy. Halfway through organising London, Bob suddenly turned to me and insist insisted we also put on a concert in the USA at the same time. We were firing on all cylinders, and I had to split my team in two, one half in Philadelphia and the other half at Wembley. We were running on oxygen, no sleep, and a belief that we were all doing the right thing for humanity. It was pretty awesome. This is when leadership skills became really paramount. I had to manage two teams, one in the UK, the other in the US. In addition, I had to manage Bob, which was 24-7. The team had to overcome so many hurdles and I had to keep morale to the highest level. The team in the USA were being, being bashed ordered by the not invented here syndrome and I had to use all my skills in overcoming this issue plus egos the size of a house in the UK. The concert was very ambitious and we were breaking new ground constantly. The biggest issue was timing. The night before the turntable, we had a big turntable on the stage so that we could have three acts at a time, one in the front, one set up 
and one coming off stage to keep the timing going. The night before, the turntable on the stage packed up and the crew, who were absolutely exhausted, were about to walk. So I went down to Wembley at nine o'clock and stayed with the crew until the problem was fixed and really won back the loyalty and determination of my crew. I always respect the people working with me on projects and I'm prepared to roll up my sleeves and help when necessary. I couldn't be as successful as I have been without the people around me. Our target was to raise a million pounds, but little did we know that we would end up raising initially 140 million pounds and currently over 200 million pounds. At the BBC, the head of daytime planning, Roger Lawton, was a believer and through his good offices and Michael Grade, the director general of the BBC, a global TV network was put together together with a guy who's been my business partner ever since Kevin Wall who kept calling me up from LA saying I could sell this TV all over the world so we gave him his shot never before had anyone presented two simultaneous concerts on two continents nor had 160 countries ever agreed to show 16 hours of music on television non-stop. Live Aid changed the way attitudes towards fundraising and changed the way that media viewed music. I mentioned earlier that Bruce Springsteen was performing three nights at Wembley Stadium. However, it didn't start out this way. I had booked ten nights at Earl's Court in order to present six concerts with Bruce because you had to build an arena inside this massive great barn. We never wanted to play outdoors until he was play persuaded to play a beautiful ven venue in Denver called Red Rocks. The way Earl's Court worked was he had to buy a block of dates up front in order to change the exhibition hall into a concert venue. I'd done this as I was sure after discussion with his management that this was the right thing to do. And then Red Rocks happened. Bruce's manager called to say that he'd really enjoyed the experience and wanted to play the stadium. I was stuffed to the tune of half a million pounds, less the profit from the stadium shows, which weren't anywhere close to what I needed. I searched high and low to replace Bruce with another headliner, but to no avail. I thought about mass military bands, orchestras, and even a massive car boot sale just to get some money back, none of which made sense. And then someone in my office mentioned that Pavarotti had just played his first arena concert in Atlanta. Get him, I said, not knowing what I was getting into. It took three months to get his manager to speak to me, and when we finally met, I talked him into performing at an arena in London. However, I didn't understand how classical musicians worked, and when we finally struck a deal, his manager informed me that the concert was actually for the following year, and in August, not July, because he was so booked up. <laughs> Luck was on my side again, and I commenced a 27-year relationship with Luciano Pavarotti, taking to him every corner of the earth until he passed away. I've taken time to explain about my formative years and some of the issues I've had to deal with. What has kept me going with all these issues is that I've enjoyed every single minute of my life. Luck and timing have played a major part in my development. The word no is not in my mantra. However, promoting and the art of saying no, that means despite the opportunities given to me, one always has to do the math. If you're uncertain whether financially a project will not work, don't do it. Even so, you may not always be right, but in your mind you must feel that the project has a shot at working and you must do everything in your power to mitigate each event. If you believe in something, never give up, certainly at the first hurdle. Fulfill your dreams, but always keep one foot on the floor. Entrepreneurship is taking risk, but risk at a level where you can survive if it all goes wrong. Today it's harder, harder than ever to break through as competition is fierce, unless of course you're in the tech business. But even those prime examples that you're reading about, Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc., 
all started as a dream with people determined against all the odds to succeed. Starting my life at Brighton College of Technology as a pharmacy student at a college of my choice, I thought that I knew what I wanted to do. But then it was a huge shock to find out only six weeks into my course that it was to be cancelled due to the lack of funds at the university. And then I arrived late for a lecture and the rest is history. When our business started, there was no support system. A roadie who was normally a non-performing friend of the band and a van and everybody carried the gear into the venue and off they went. Production services developed as the band had more success and played bigger venues. When I started, there was no official merchandising of any quality. In fact, the Pirates had much better merchandising than the, the, than the band did. Tour catering didn't exist. All you got was curly sandwiches backstage. Venue supplied backstage food, which was crap. And I learned very early on that a happy crew means a happy band. So I started a catering com company. Merchandising, as I said, was rubbish, so I started a merchandising company called Brockham. Artists needed tour managers and great production managers, so we trained them. Bands like The Who thought the hotels were there as party venues and were often trashed until they had no decent hotels to stay in. Other artists like Keith Richards thought that they could completely refurbish by home, their homes by taking the cutlery, crockery and the bed linen from every hotel they stayed in. In fact, I went on one tour with them there, where there was a van that followed the trucks and um, he literally, he would order up three lots of room service, never eat anything because he never ate, and just cleared the tablecloths, the linen, the knives and forks, the plates, the cup saucers, put them all in a big trunk, off they went into the van. Leslie West, um, who was in Mountain, took an antique bedside rug from the jewel sank in Paris, only to be arrested by Interpol in Hamburg. Keith Moon thought that TV sets were toys to be lobbed into swimming pools. Alice Cooper demanded a very warm room for what I thought was a weird crew member, Mr. Snake, but it turned out to be a python. <laughs> and then we all got sophisticated to the point where some acts that go out on the road even today, the production outweighs the income of the show and the size of the venue. How many shows have you all been to where half the gear never leaves the truck? And then there are the 40 to 50 truck tours where the tour has to be ex extended purely to pay for the production. That life's now changing. It's amazing how sophisticated EDM has become with innovative lighting and effect techniques. I brought Barbara Streisand to the UK the first time she played on stage for over 20 years. She was so paranoid about performing that, our produ that her production manager emptied every production house in LA and took the kitchen sink on the road. All the aud audience wanted to do was to see her perform, but the staging was insane. I even had to find zero fat frozen yogurt, which I finally located in Miami. I flew it in, set up a stall for her with six flavours and all the trimmings, only to find out that she wanted the only flavour I didn't have. <laughs> Just before Christmas, I was invited to the reopening of the NIA arena in Birmingham to see Michael Bublé. He has the most extraordinary light show I've seen in ages. However, in my opinion, it didn't fit the songs that looked out of place. And again, all the fans wanted to do was see Michael perform as, he, as he's so brilliant at on a stage. Cat Stevens asked me to manage him, insisted on a huge production for his comeback tour and then fired me because he didn't make enough money out of the tour. How the world's changed. We live in strange and difficult times that the problems in the music business are kind of mirrored by the major issues in the world. In the real world, we have the UN as a talking point to try and address issues. In music, we have no such thing. There are many conferences like this one that take place all over the world, but most of them are siloed. Strangely enough, Medem is quite unique, and it is 
I don't work for me then, but I, all I, I, I've always been a great supporter of it because it's a great talking shop and people from every walk of life, from every facet of the business come here. And with our accelerator program, which I'm really proud to be a judge of, we've now got lots of new acts coming down here. We had over 400 acts entered for it and we brought a dozen of them down. They've all performed on that little stage just around the corner. And um, it's a fantastic opportunity them and spending time with them, them and their managers this morning, they've all enjoyed it. They, it's given them the opportunity to meet with people they would never ever get to. And I think that's really important. The business has no talking place to look at issues that affect all of us. We watched the demise of the record industry and said, OK, if people don't want to buy records, they'll still support live shows. Live's a unique experience. Record companies still not in, do not engage with the live businesses. Publishers and collection sizes are at war with record companies. Promoters have them meeting and moan about agents. Agents have their meetings and see how they can extract more money from the promoters. Managers meet and talk and watch everyone fight each other so that they can see how they can get the best advantage for their act. And of course, the most money from live as royalties are dwindling. We currently have an issue in the UK today with the collection societies. They want to put the rates up and are having a pop at the promoters. But the truth is, there's no point in having a pop at the promoters because it's the artists that take most of the money. So most of the upside is coming from them. How fantastic would it have been? The heads of the collection side are here. There's some managers here for the managers forum. All they needed to do was have a lovely lunch on the beach or in one of the great restaurants around here and they could sort it out civilly. What's going to happen? It's going to end up with a load of lawyers taking a load of money and a court case unnecessary. Meantime, a gaping hole is appearing on the horizon and none of us are doing anything about it. So what is the future? Where are the new global rock acts? Where's the long-term development? The age of pop and dance is with us, but it's still transient. Downloads have been surpassed by streaming with diminished artist returns and live shows are too expensive. Festivals are having problems, and I made a speech uh, last week at the Hay Festival, although I got slightly misquoted. The reason why festivals are having problems, not because the festival's no good, because there's no headliners. There aren't enough headliners to draw everything else up there. Consequently, the boutique festivals are winning the day. I realised this, and last year, I produced the first on Blackheath Festival, which became a critical success. Boutique festivals with more to offer than endless lists of artists are becoming much more appealing. Ticket distribution sucks. Fans find it virtually impossible to find a ticket to buy a ticket at face value. A ticket is an entry point to enjoy the experience, not a commodity, so that we can screw fans for more money. The secondary market has become a blot on our landscape. We've allowed third parties to take control of our business. We can and should beat them. And it's not difficult to do. I did it with the Led Zeppelin reunion concert recently. I did it with The Who. I did it with Jeff Beck in America. And I'm currently doing it with David Gilmore, who's about to perform Start a Tour in September. We cannot stand by and screw the hand that feeds us. All the fans, when they do, react back quickly, as the record companies have found out. Too many tickets are creamed off by artists and the secondary ticket sellers, creating a false market, turning fans off from buying, e.g., take that in London, for, you know, where I, as far as I can work out, something like a million and a half pounds worth of tickets were creamed off to the secondary market. The Rolling Stones 50th anniversary concerts where over 3,000 tickets were given to the secondary market per venue. Premium tickets have now crept into theatre, but what do they offer the fan? Only an increasing price by holding off the market great seats which regular fans can't afford. 
Major ticket agencies all have secondary sites like AXS, Ticketmaster, etc. And now they're in new venues, but soon they'll have problems filling. Most of the venues today, certainly in the UK, live off the fact there are comedians who could sell out 10, 20 and, and upwards nights, not the rock acts. Is the age of rock dead? As the dinosaurs die out, who's going to replace them? Of course there are exceptions. Currently, Ed Sheeran, Sam Smith, Bruno Mars, Beyonce. This is the difficulty with the business, though, of not communicating enough. Publishers are trying to milk the exploitation of artists for TV, streaming and promotion. Promoters will have to decide once and for all where they sit with ticketing. If they carry on report the supporting the resale of tickets, then fans will slowly but surely drift away. What happened to that creating demand for the next tour? The festival market, particularly in the UK and Europe, are peaking. Agents are holding promoters to ransom. What is the agent's role going forward? Who are they working for? Why do agents push promoters to do that extra show on the tour that rarely works? This often leaves the last show not sold out. Currently in London, Neil Diamond, Bette Midler and even Paul McCartney are recent examples where they got pushed into that extra show, the promoter, and they shouldn't be doing it. Our business is based on mystery, demand, experience, and fans going to be able to see and watch their heroes. If they can't get a ticket, they have to pay through the nose for it, and the artists play that extra show where that demand isn't kept up, then we've got a very sad business in front of us. Ultimately, outpricing artists is causing too many festivals to fail. The public are fed up with large festivals, golden circles, premium VIP tickets, where the average fan cannot get near the stage without paying a premium. Is that right? No, only because the agents are demanding too much for the artists and then back to the beginning. Not enough drawing acts to fill the facilities. Maybe the Live Nation model is the answer, being an all-round service business, promoting, management, ticket seller and record company. But you cannot have just one monolith. Music's alive and well, being more available than ever, However, I think the future will be not be the same as we know it now. The Q communication industry is talking about quadruplacing, TV and film, music and communication all under one roof. Cable and satellite, mobile communication, fixed line transmission, all to be unified in a company. This will be a big fight and some opportunity. But is that the way creating music should be? You cannot create to order. So we need new promoters finding and staying with new artists who can grow naturally without being forced into arenas with, that they're not ready for. We need record companies and publishing publishers to stop fighting and work together to nurture new talent. We need to decide the future of the collecting societies or whether they have merit in the new landscape. Everyone is looking to take more out, but not everyone is prepared to put value back. I've spent my whole life working on a diverse range of projects, which has kept my sanity and my interests, from producing operas to Cirque du Soleil, from management to even representing the Crazy Horse in Paris. Currently, I'm working with a Dutch theatre company to change the way that theatre is presented. We're about to commence construction on a brand new theatre at Wembley, and we're going to host the first stage presentation of the Hunger Games next year. There's plenty of talent out there, but that talent needs champions to help them through the clutter. And we in the business must be the curators to give the business a, a fruitful life in the future. Thank you. So, questions? Thank you. That was such a beautiful journey to listen to. Oh, 
Harvey. Um, the first thing is I have a big hello to you from Liz Moon and John Moon, good friends of mine. Um, my name's Wazzy Brewster. I run a company called the Midi Mu Music Company in Deptford and we do artist development. And I think one of the questions that I want to ask you is what, what was one of your most memorable failures? And... Um, Failure. One of the, your most memorable failures. I've had and lots. <laughs> so choose one. And, and what did you learn from it? I, um, I got taught... With, with, there was an eclipse, which was all over England, just around 1999, 2000, and, uh, or 98. And um, it was all happening in Devon and Cornwall. And I got sweet talk by the council to produce a festival. So we put a great festival together, strangely enough called the Eclipse Festival, in a site in the middle of nowhere um, that the council gave us, and it all looked good. And then about two weeks before the event, the police decided that actually there were going to be so many people in Devon and Cornwall that it was going to sink. So they literally closed all the roads, all the motorways were shut, they stopped all the trains, they stopped people going down there, and the net result was nobody went to Devon and Cornwall during this eclipse. And it was a joke. We set up this uh, festival for about 15,000 a day, and I think we had about two or 3,000 each day, not because people didn't want to go, not because we didn't have a great bill of acts, they just couldn't get there. Thank you, the police. So that was a massive, massive error. Preempting what I thought acts wanted to play when you're starting to go through your booking cycle, like the Springsteen example, um, is another error you have to be very careful. You think you know what an artist wants, and you think maybe you have a relationship with them to such extent as all good, and then out of left, left field, something else happens. So I got stuck with a half a million pound bill that um, the uh, venue owners wouldn't let me off. Um, so that was a very expensive preemption idea that absolutely didn't work. But I still have a great relationship with Bruce and his manager and somehow I guess it gets made up. You've got to be able to move on from the bad experiences, not bear grudges and try and figure it out going forward. Thank that you very helps. much. Thank you. Any other questions? At the back there. Uh, I agree almost to what you say. My only question is, you said you, we need a new promoter. My question is what we can do when the promoter uh, doesn't want to play the new band? You know, they are not known and don't want to play the headliner because they want everything for free. Because the legend are a part of our history. We, we have to re deserve, respect their work. And uh, like you go to see a specialist in, in medicine, we pay the different price. It's the same thing in the music. Musicians deserve respect for their work, known or unknown, and they deserve to be paid for the work they, they, they give. I agree with you, 100%. I've always believed that musicians, creative people, have to get paid for their work. Yeah. It doesn't matter how little it is, they have to get paid. That's the principle. We don't work for free. Thank you. Record companies don't work for free. These are employees don't work for free Thank so why should artists have to keep giving away their music for free it's like i have two sayings that i constantly remind people about about pirating do people really wake up in the morning and go oh my god it's a lovely day what can i pirate today they don't do people really wake up, wake up in the morning, we have a big issue and it's going to come up soon, particularly out of France this year, about climate change, and say, oh my God, my rubbish bin's only half empty, I've got to find some more rubbish to stuff in it, so the council can find me even more if I overdo it. They don't. People don't naturally want to steal. They steal because they can and because in some respects, they've been ripped off. 
and so it's getting their own back. But I have always believed, even in the days where the big acts were looking for support acts, and that support act was chosen not because of their musical skill or whether they fitted, but how much the record company or the management would contribute towards the tour to pay. And they got nothing. I never believed in that. So I agree with you. But we have to have new promoters. I can't have people like me and all my fellow promoters that grew up at the same time being the only people in town. We have to replace, we have to replenish. Promote new promoters have to work with new bands and build it up the way they want to do it, not the way we want to do it. We've done it. I've seen the best of it. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Time for someone else to take over. I'm so happy you said that because you know what? I'm going to come to see you. My husband is Chris Holmes for, from a guitarist of Wasp. And when I see the respect the promoter have for him, he's a legend in heavy metal and he don't going to, pay for fr to play for free. Then I'm going to see you because you mean to be a great promoter who respect a musician. Right? Please do. Then I see you after. <laughs> yeah. Thank you do. so much. <laughs> please do. Any more questions? Yes, please. Oh, oh, oh. Um, do you have any advice for artists? Yeah. Go into the Accelerator program next year because it's a real opportunity. Go for every com competition, every opportunity you can. Do not only rely on digital. There are so many acts today who just think doing all the digital uh, communication with Instagram and Facebook and this and that and the other is all they need to do and then somebody will pick them up. YouTube as a channel which everybody thinks is Nirvana is a total fucking joke. I don't know anybody. There is so much clutter on YouTube. What is the point? And the truth is, the YouTube music channels that they keep crapping on about, I don't know anyone that watches it. I've never seen any success out of it. So relying on YouTube is absolutely not the way to go. If you're a live performer, perform live. Go through the pain, go through the sweat, keep going. Because that way, if you're good, you will build up a fan base and those fans will never leave you. Which is why even today those big acts that I grew up with are still big because they have those same fans and their, and their children and indeed their grandchildren who want to go and see their heroes because they did that work live. It's hard, it's grind, but it pays dividends. Hello, it is very interesting to listen to what you have been saying. Uh, I am myself from Armenia, the country that uh, is not very well known to the rest of the world, especially to the music management, but the country that has very talented people, musicians, in various spheres. Um, how, my question is, how, uh, what path should I take and whether they can uh, directly apply to you or to someone else uh, in Britain uh, in order to get the music going and in order to bring it on a bigger stage. I just would like to listen to your advice on that. Um, okay, so um, your country, your president decided to have a presence of medium. Um, I'm not being rude, but I would think 90% of everybody down in Medium, until you got here, didn't know where Armenia was. I certainly didn't. I think it's fantastic what they've done. So, and I saw a lot of the bands playing on Friday night, and some of them were quite amazing. So I think that the way for countries with such a rich cultural talent like yours, one way of doing it is for the government to do some cultural exchanges. I went to China um, because um, the Chinese were prepared to have a little crack in the door and get a reaction of, of what popular artists meant. I took the first, pretty much the first Western pop act to Russia in 1978. Uh, and that came out as a result 
of a biannual treaty that the British government and the Russian government had on exchanging culture. That meant, in their mind, was the Royal Shakespeare Company, the London Symphony Orchestra, the Royal Opera House and the Royal Ballet. And I went to see the Foreign Office because... Um, it's a very strange story, but Elton John basically retired and said, I'm never going on. He, he did a show, a series of shows at Wembley. The last show had Stevie Wonder playing. The audience were going nuts. I don't know what went through Elton's mind. He got in a strop, got in a car, and went home, said, I'm never going to play again. Okay. <laughs> he disappeared for nearly two years, suddenly called me up, and he said, I've just finished a new album, and I've promised Polygram, which was pre-universal, that I'd play a gig at the Châtelet, which is a beautiful theatre in Paris, uh, to, to uh, all their employees and all, their, all the foreign affiliates to play my new album. So I said, yes. And he said, well, I haven't got a show. I said, OK, so you need two weeks, three weeks to rehearse a brand new show. If you're playing the Chatelet, you can't just sit on stage in the black. So we've got to have lights and sound and rehearsal. And he said, mm. he said, I'm not playing. I'm not doing another tour. <laughs> so we had this crazy lunch where every five seconds, I'm not going on the road, I'm not doing another tour, just don't do this one gig. I said, OK. So I said, how much? He said, how much will it cost? I said, about 150 to 200,000. He said, oh, my God. <laughs> I said, well, he said, well, if I am going to do some dates, I'd like to play some unusual places. I said, like where? So he said, I want to go to Russia. I said, OK. He said, uh, I want to go to Egypt. I said, OK. And he said, I'd love to go to Israel. I said, OK. And <laughs> we went away and... Um, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I phoned up the foreign office and I said, how do I get a pop act to Russia? And they said, what do you mean? I said, Elton John would like to go to Russia. And they went, what? And I said, yeah. So what they did, there was a, a gathering of the, minister, the Russian Ministry of Culture, the UK Ministry of, uh, of Arts. They all met. There was a big lunch at Lancaster House, which is the home of the... Uh, of, I don't know whose home it is really, but a government place. And um, they had all these meetings and the Russian Minister of Culture got up, made a speech. I'm sitting in right at the back of beyond trying to figure out what the hell's going on because I did not understand how diplomacy worked. And he stood up and said, I'm really pleased that we have the Bolshoi coming to England and the uh, Royal Philharmonic going to Russia and the Royal Opera House coming and blah, blah, blah. But we want some concerts for the masses. And he sat down. And I'm going, OK, great, wonderful. The next thing I know, a bottle of champagne arrived at my table and these two guys in the forest, foreign office clapped me on the back and said, fantastic, Elton John's guy to Russia. And I said, what? what? What happened? He said, this is called diplomacy. So that's how it worked. So through the cultural exchange programme, it's an opportunity to get your music and your artists through. So... You should talk to, um, there has to be a, some train to go through, but that's a good way of starting it off. And then once people have seen you, it's up to them to decide whether they like you or not. A pleasure. So. One, two. Okay. Yeah. My name is Rendani, I'm from South Africa, and uh, fortunately last night we were doing a showcase, and I hope you were there to watch some of our acts, but uh, we'll talk to you about that later on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I run a music uh, label, and uh, I'm, I got into pro, pro, pro music promotion, and I'm doing a, an event, a, a festival on the 18th of July that runs in parallel with Nelson Mandela Day. And what I, with the, funded by the Department of Arts and Culture South Africa and what you said uh, to her was very relevant making partnerships with government departments but what I wanted to ask you because I came here in the middle of your presentation is uh, whether you could have any interest to form partnerships with may maybe uh, African promoters who might want to get into the business as you said as uh, 
you as old guys, you're getting old and then you want to introduce new guys and maybe have some sort of mentorship to other people or, or youngsters who are trying to, to get into the business. And whether you, uh, and again, whether you could have interest in African music in general and, uh, and taking it uh, abroad in, in, in your festivals. Uh, we do have African artists over the years. I've taken lots of acts to South Africa. I work with South African promoters. Um, we did the pre-opening of the World Cup, although I'm not sure I should be talking about the World Cup at the moment, in South Africa in a stadium in Soweto, which was a huge success. We uh, and have done a lot of, uh, of work with South African artists. So the answer is we do, yes. There's some great South African promoters, all of whom, um, you know, are growing. It's a big marketplace. And maybe you should talk to some of them and see where you can get to. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to introduce you to some of them because that's your hometown and that's your, yeah, we could do that afterwards. Okay. One more question. Oh, I can do no. t t more than one question. Um, hello. Uh, I just wanted to know, what, what did you learn from doing Live Aid, how did it change the way people did business in live music? Good and bad. The good was that we realised that musicians above anybody else in the artist community are prepared to stand out and be counted. Actors didn't do anything, film stars didn't do anything, authors didn't do anything, and initially sports people didn't, although they did subsequently. And what I've found time after time, that it's the music community that stands up and offers their services to help. And because they know they have so many fans following them, they can use their good offices to do it. The bad side of Live Aid was that it created the aura of celebrity because until Live Aid, certainly in England, national newspapers only ever talked about rock music and, and, and the sphere that we worked in if they'd been busted or there was a divorce. That was it. Otherwise, they didn't really talk about it. And suddenly, the newspapers realised that artists are kind of mini-celebrities and they started to build that up and that whole era of celebrity-based artists started to become important and it was the, the it was the media it was what we call in Eng, in england the red top newspapers who really created this whole environment of why you read about all you read about is artists that are mainly pop acts i might say and what they get up to and with the women how little clothes they wear and the twerking and all the other crap that goes on that's driven by them it's not driven by the real music business. So the downside was that the media realised they could sell newspapers off the back of our business. And in my opinion, that was the start of the rot and started to kill the natural creative juices of great bands and great talent into being pop stars and celebrity-led stars. So that was the bad side. And of course, the real good side was so much money. We, we started the project with Bob and I thought we could raise a million pounds. The night before, we talked to each other about 2.30 in the morning, on a, that Saturday morning, and um, we, we, Bob said, you know what, I think we could get five million quid. None of us had any idea that within a week we'd have 140 million pounds in. And we worked very, very hard to try and make sure that that money is dispersed um, a, quickly, because we don't have any overhead. We have no staff, we don't have anything. All we have is our auditors and, a, and an advisory group that examine the requests that come in to see if they're real, if they're value, etc. And we're constant, we still, we don't promote, we don't advertise, we don't talk about it, and we still, um, we still dish out over a million pounds a year. And just before Christmas, when... Bob and Mish decided to celebrate the 30th anniversary um, of Live Aid and they redid the single, much to a lot of the press's annoyance. Um, we raised just over £11 million and all that money went to help 
uh, the whole cause of Ebola to help with some of the hospitals, field clinics, doctors, and now we're dealing with the orphans of people that kids that have just been left out because their families have been wiped out how to help them and how to deal with them and give them a life and we 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 basically try and get the money out as fast as possible hopefully to the right era so that's the other good thing but the start of the celebrity musician uh unfortunately came out of live aid so there you go I lost my voice. Um, first, I really enjoyed your talk. It was the highlight of my entire medium experience. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you had mentioned that recording artists need champions who will help them to navigate the complexities of this business. Um, I will ask if you'd be open to meeting we, with me for a minute after. Um, I've been inspired by uh, my musical legend, Harry Chapin, who started World Hunger Year and uh, to use music as a force for doing good in the world. So I absolutely appreciate the things that you've done in your career. And I was wondering if you'd be open to meeting with me. We have over 100 original songs and five studio albums are touring, but are absolutely looking for a champion to bring things to the next level, to do what we can to get music out there to, uh, for positive causes. Hey, but do, I, I, are you looking for a record deal? Is that what you Yes, want? I'm looking for a record deal and management. Well, this is me, Dem. I'm not in the record business, so <laughs> there's plenty of people around here that do record. Do I mean, the, the truth is, they used to call them A&R men. They used to go around at every bar, club, venue, people's houses to try and find talent. I don't even know if they still exist. And if they do, I don't know where they go. But nevertheless... Um, the recorded business is still there. It will, it, it, it will level out at a point where it still works. There are more independent labels than ever before. There are more ways of putting music out. You know, there's all these crowdfunded businesses. There's Pitchfork. There's, I've heard of two or three different apps that you could put out where acts put their music on and people look at it and vote for it and then it crawls up. There's so many different ways of doing it. Do I think an album as a body of work will continue as it is? I don't know. All I do know is that vinyl, demand for vinyl, vinyl sales have gone up exponentially, which is a really interesting thing. The problem is that the vinyl factories are scrabbling around trying to find the old people that used to press records because they don't know how to do it to teach the next generation. And if you want to put a vinyl record out, you have to book three months at least ahead to get in there. But there's so many different ways now of putting music out. You've got to think wide and think clever. And maybe you don't put out an album as it is, because I, I don't know whether a lot of the younger generation, that's what, how they want to listen to music. They like the idea of tracks. The, the danger is it's very transient. So this week they like this track, they like Kanye West. Next week, it's, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, they like Bruce Springsteen for five seconds. Next week, they like someone else. Then they hear a new band. They like that. And it's in and out and gone, which is, makes it very difficult to break through. But if you've got, look, at the end of the day, there are two standards that run our whole business. One is performance. And the other one, which is more important, is the song. So if a song's great, Adele, and the performance is great, somehow, with all the clutter, all the crap, CDs are dead, everything's dead, she can sell, someone correct me if I'm wrong, 18 million albums are still selling. Same with Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran came through the clutter. Nobody knew what, when, where, and how. This year, Ed Sheeran, on his own, will sell out three shows at Wembley, has sold out three shows at Wembley Stadium. That's 230,000 people are coming to see him. Somewhere the message got out. So you have to just think it through. I mean, 
I try and uh, uh, and put the issues on the table of the business, but believe me, if I was the problem solver, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on my boat in the beach. But I know what the issues are, at least. So you've got to keep trying. I think that's it. They're telling me my time's up. Thank you very much for coming. I actually thought I'd be talking to myself and that round pillar in the middle, but I'm really delighted you all came, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.